Fredericksburg, Virginia is a small town located between Richmond and the District of Columbia. With a population of under 30,000 inhabitants, this city and surrounding area is home to many historic sites such as battlefields and historic residential houses from the Civil War and even earlier. With one of the largest factors of Civil War conflicts being over slavery, the roots of racism and black oppression run deep in this quaint little town. After the Civil War, society remained segregated by race, much to the dismay of local minorities. During this time, many citizens fought for rights of African Americans particularly, for things as small as sharing water fountains to as broad as equality in education. This greatly impacted the segregated black community. The lack of quality education was largely due to the absence of government funding and the dependence on private donations. Teachers received lower pay and students had fewer and lower quality facilities and supplies. The segregation of the school system provided poor education for African Americans, making it especially hard to acquire the proper skills needed to move up in the world. So, in response to complaints from the black community, and through complex legal cases, the Virginia State Board of Education desegregated the schools of Virginia in 1968. However, even though the conflict was alleviated, the process of change wasn't easy, and the community had to go through a bumpy transition period that led to the losses of countless jobs by black teachers and administrators, black students' loss of teachers who cared about their success, and an environment which supported and encouraged the black students. In fact, almost all of the changes during the adjustment period were felt by the black students alone, not the white ones. In the wake of the Civil War, because the education of African Americans was legalized, many civil rights activists realized the need for black education beyond that of a primary level. So, black churches in the Spotsylvania area formed a coalition called the Spotsylvania Sunday School Union to found and construct a school. This reflects how black Virginians struggled to scrape together funds for educating their future. Other ways African American students gained further education were through small schools and churches that were dedicated to helping the cause. An example of this is Shiloh Baptist Church which still functions today. The church held classes at night to teach things such as reading and writing to young black Americans during the 1920s. They recognized how important the education of all youth in Fredericksburg was. One of the main reasons for this lack of government funding was the existence of the fear that African Americans would become too intelligent and take jobs from Caucasians. Whites justified these actions with a stigma toward African Americans that they were intellectually inferior, and the lack of education for black students only contributed to this belief. A terrible, self-sustaining cycle was formed. Segregation wasn't simply blacks versus whites, as it was often thought to be. Although the term was typically only used to describe such discrimination, in actuality, segregation in Fredericksburg was closer to being a social ladder system comprised of different kinds of people based on religion, race, and ethnicity. We interviewed Miss Vicki Lewis, a white woman who was a student at an all-white school during the 50s, and she had a lot to say about the social ladder that was segregation. There was a pecking order in the city. And you had a class consciousness that was very, very separate and not equal. And at the bottom of the list, uh, at the lowest part of that class separation, would be the African Americans, or as we termed it then, blacks. Next would be those of Jewish descent. And then next would be ethnic Roman Catholics. And at the top of the list, the creme de la creme, if you will, would be, they used the term WASP back then, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. Miss Lewis proceeds to describe how even as a white person, she felt as if she was treated inferior to Anglo-Saxon Protestants, since she was a Roman Catholic. This goes to show that if a white person can feel discriminated against during segregation, it is hard to imagine what African Americans and other racial minorities had to go through. Native American students, specifically, were another minority group that had to deal with the obstacles that segregation of the school system brought. They were legally considered to be black, so if they wanted an education that was more advanced than the mission schools sometimes available to them, they had to attend a black public school. These mission schools typically only went up to about 7th grade and left many Native Americans seeking additional education. However, most Native Americans refused to attend these blacks-only public schools. In efforts to maintain their culture as they faced the Racial Integrity Act of 1924, which was the act that branded them legally black. Since segregation was so harsh and unfair, many people worked toward changing the ways of both the inequitable schooling as well as society in general. Black families knew that their children were receiving worse education in comparison to what white students were getting and sought a way to equalize the situation as much as possible. The main reason which stood in the way of equal education was the Plessy v. Ferguson court case ruling, which preached a separate but equal doctrine. This essentially allowed for blatant segregation because the separation wasn't equal at all. Many people challenged these laws in future legal cases, and the most successful and notable of these was the Brown versus the Board of Education trial. The result of this case deemed the segregation laws to be unconstitutional, yet provided no means of solving this issue. 
Over the years, more pressure was put on schools to integrate their school systems. In 1968, the Supreme Court made a ruling as a result of the Charles C. Green et al. v. County School Board of New Kent County. This ruling acted as a large factor of the schools being desegregated, and soon after, many schools in Virginia did away with the separation of schools, allowing the people of America to begin the long road of compromise of the integration of schools. The Brown v. the Board of Education case in 1954 and the New Kent County School Board case in 1968 were two of the key components in creating an integrated school system. Supreme Court cases like these were one cornerstone to change but another important aspect were the student and parent protests. One of the largest and earliest of these protests was the Atkin High School walkout, which took place in 1951. At this protest organized by the students themselves, every student in the school marched out into the streets of Kingston, North Carolina, to demonstrate their dissent toward the unfairness between black and white public schools in the area. And even though this did not lead to a quick solution for the school, it did open the nation's eyes to the inherent problem with the segregated school system. Many struggles were undergone throughout the fight for desegregation. After countless protests and legal cases, the minority communities were finally able to desegregate the education system. But this conflict was far from over. Now that the schools were combined, they had to deal with the difficult transition that came with the school's desegregation. Students, teachers, and staff had to be combined, and buildings had to be designated to become each newly integrated school. The biggest problem with the ways the schools were desegregated is that most of the change had to be facilitated by the black community. The black students had to change buildings, the black students had to acclimate to their new teachers, and the black students had to find their new identities in their new school. These changes were also very sudden. In an interview by Duke University, Ms. Porter, a school supervisor in Norfolk, said, We as teachers had to be there to nurture them, to help them along, to recognize their difficulties, to work with them. In addition, although the African American students had to endure these many changes, the effect desegregation of education had on African American teachers and staff were much longer lasting. Most of these individuals lost their jobs since the majority of schools were taught by white teachers. When the school was integrated, the school was shut down. I no longer had that job as a customer at the school. Many teachers went other places. So I changed my uh, career and began to work in the, in the in the commercial industry, uh, I didn't. Gra I, I did not uh, retire from uh, as a teacher. I retired as a manager of a Safeway store because of the integration. They they, 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 they didn't hire me in, in Stafford County or Fredericksburg. Mr. Brown, former principal of H.H. H. Poole Middle School, recalls his experience of being fired from his job there and having to completely shift career paths. After taking all of these consequences into account, the reason the desegregation of the schools was a compromise was because unequal education was replaced with a more equal system, yet it came with many drawbacks. The shift in society that the 1968 desegregation brought was huge, and many echoes of this conflict can still be felt today. In fact, many believe that still, even currently, our school system isn't truly integrated, as students tend to separate into friend groups by race and associate with those of their own color. This type of segregation is led by students themselves instead of a system. In addition to socially, a gap in educational performance between races is very evident in the Fredericksburg school system and can be seen by SOL scores in Virginia. These outline the differences in success between blacks, whites, Asians, and Hispanics. Many of these scores may have other variables affecting them, but much of this gap is due to historical racial oppression. One other racial division in today's society is how racial populations tend to settle. This division is evident in the Fredericksburg area, as seen in the Census Bureau map, which displays how each race tends to concentrate in different sections of the map. In an interview with Xavier Richardson, who was a student in Fredericksburg at both segregated and desegregated schools, the idea that integration and desegregation differ in definition was discussed. Desegregated versus integrated because the schools were no longer segregated, but they were not fully integrated in terms of um, the interaction with students and the, the staff and everything else. This segregation, while not legally supported, can still be seen as a cultural division. The racial division in Virginia, while it's still noticeable, has made massive strides since the integration of schools. Despite the pain and suffering experienced by many families during the transition period, the long-term result improves society as a whole. In the interview with Vicki Lewis, she captures the importance of integration. If I don't associate with people who are different from me, then how am I supposed to know um, how they think or how they feel or what their view of the world is and how are they supposed to know mine and how are we ever supposed to live in peace with one another 
if we don't associate. 